Screen Directors Playhouse, star Alan Ladd, production Beyond Glory, director John Farrell. This is the Screen Directors Playhouse, one of the weekly features on NBC's All-Star Festival of comedy, music, mystery, and drama. Brought to you by the makers of Anison for fast relief from the pain of headache, neuritis, and neuralgia. And by RCA Victor, world leader in radio, first in recorded music, first in television. Tonight, the Screen Director's Playhouse is pleased to present transcribed for the first time on the air a story of recurrent valor. Here now is the first act of the Screen Director's Playhouse presentation of Beyond Glory, starring Alan Ladd in his original role of Rocky Gilman, with Peter Hansen as Lachlan. Dedicated to the Corps of Cadets at the United States Military Academy, and in particular to those cadets who, after proving themselves on the battlefront of World War II, return to accept the discipline of West Point in order to better themselves in their profession and in the service of their country. The Board of Investigation at West Point is in special session. There is an air of tension which is heightened by the contrast of uniform and mufti which dots the room. Introductions are just being completed between the board and three newcomers who have just entered. Gentlemen, this is Mr. Denmore Sr., Raymond Denmore Jr., mm -hmm. and I am Lou Proctor, their attorney. How do you do? How do you gentlemen? Do? This is Mr. Julian, chairman of the board. I am General Bond, superintendent of the academy. How do you do? How do you, do, sir? you gentlemen are ready? Yes, we're quite ready, thank you. Then will you sit at this table here, please? Come in, sir. Sir, Cadet Gilman reports to the superintendent his orders. At ease. Your place is there. Uh, Mr. Julian, if it's agreeable to you, I believe everyone is ready to proceed. Our principal witness, Cadet Gilman, is here. Instead of using the term witness, sir, we prefer to call him defendant, General. That is a question for the board to decide. Go ahead, Mr. Proctor. Thank you, sir. Now, on the surface, this matter would appear too insignificant to justify the convening of a group as this. A Congressional Board of Investigation under the distinguished chairmanship of Representative Julian. My client's son, Raymond Dinmore Jr., was compelled to resign from the United States Military Academy for an alleged violation of something with the high-sounding name of the Honor Code of the Corps of Cadets. He was accused of lying by another member of the Academy, Cadet Captain Rockwell Gilman. An apparently insignificant matter, important only to Raymond and his family, an incident. But we are going to prove that only at West Point could such a deplorable incident occur. We believe that the Academy is undemocratic and therefore a misuse of the taxpayers' money. Gentlemen, we object to these inflammatory remarks. Cadet Gilman is not on trial. He was called as a witness in his proceeding. If counsel can prove these accusations and link them with the matter at hand, they're admissible, General. Thank you, Mr. Julian. I should like to call Mr. Denmore first and then his son. Very well. Mr. Denmore, would you take the witness chair and tell us how and when you first began to worry about Raymond? Well, it was about two months after he entered the academy. Now, Ray is not the kind of complaint, but we could read between the lines. Finally... One letter came that worried us very much. So I took a plane and dropped in on this. You received your letter, Mr. Denmore. I have here your son's records. He certainly has no academic difficulties. No, no, he's a bright boy. It's uh, something else. The physical side? Well, it isn't the normal course of training, General. It's this, this hazing, this bullying. Bullying? There is no physical mistreatment of fourth classmen at the academy, Mr. Denmore. Ha! I'm afraid that's not what I heard, General. You've made a very serious charge against the academy, Mr. Denmore. I look into it immediately. In the meantime, why don't you drop in and see your son? I'll take you down at once. <laughs> The 
look, Rocky. I discovered this boodle behind his field equipment. Lucky for the company it passed inspection. Sir, may I make a statement? You may not. Get a brace on those shoulders. Let's hear a statement, Thomas. Not statement, alibi. I put it there after the inspection, sir. It doesn't ever belong there, Mr. Dumb John. That's the second time in a week, and I intend to report it. No report will be necessary. We'll let Mr. Danmore repeat his favorite speech. Go ahead. Pop off, mister. I'm not going to be pushed around by any hero who fought the war at West Point. My father is... is just as important as any... any general in the army. Ray! Who made up that speech? Plebes are always given speeches to provide entertainment, Mr. Denmore. A curious form of entertainment. Who's responsible? I am, sir. I'm responsible for everything that happens in this company. Oh. Then you made up this speech. Not the first time, sir. Ray? Plebes aren't allowed to make up anything. Mr. Denmore? Did you or did you not make that speech up yourself the first week you were here? No, sir, I didn't. That'll be an official statement unless you want to change it immediately. I won't change it. What difference does it make who thought it up? This is the Honor Committee's business, sir. Your son is lying. Honor Committee? Cadets are required to report breaches of honor to the Honor Committee. Uh, gee. I'd like to talk to Raymond alone, General. May I take him outside? Very well, Mr. Denmore. Come along, Raymond. Carry on, gentlemen. Now, Ray, I want to know the truth. Did you make up that speech on your own? No, Dad, I didn't. flew home that night, positive that everything would be all right. Later in the week, Raymond arrived. He'd been forced to resign from the academy. Convicted on the unsupported testimony of the man who had been persecuting him, Cadet Gilman. I would like to make an official statement concerning treatment of new cadets by upperclassmen. Under no circumstances is an upperclassman allowed to strike a plebe or order him to do anything injurious to his health or repugnant to his conscience. There is no regulation of the academy more strictly enforced. There are many methods of mistreatment, General. Raymond, would you take the stand, please? Now, suppose you tell us about a few of your encounters with Cadet Gilman so that the board may judge whether or not there is any bullying at West Point. Well, well, it began the first day we got here. We'd all heard about the beast detail that would be waiting for us when we got inside the barracks area... None of us knew exactly what the upperclassmen in the detail were going to do. We found out soon enough. When we were ordered to halt and fall out. Drop the bag. Drop it! Stand tall, mister. What's your name? Ray Denmore. No, it's not. It's New Cadet Denmore. You understand? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now, what's your name? New Cadet Denmore. New Cadet Denmore, sir. New Cadet Denmore, sir. That's better. Now, pull up your tie, roll down your sleeves. Mr. Denmore, you've joined the best company in the Corps. Do you know who's going to make it that way? Yes, sir. You are, that's right. You to salute all members of the detail. We'll recognize them by the white gloves. Yes, sir. Keep on the double in this area at all times. Do you expect me to remember all of this? You didn't have permission to ask a question, mister. Now let's hear your report to the first sergeant. Sir, new cadet Denmore reports to the first sergeant of the first company as ordered. Very well. Report to the first sergeant. It wasn't four hours later that he got me again. New man, halt. Weren't you told to keep on the double in this area? Yeah, I guess I was. You don't guess. You either know or you believe. It's yes, sir, no, sir. Yes, sir. And you salute when you're spoken to. Yes, sir. Pop up that chest. Move that chin. You have to keep on the double as you're told. Yes, sir. Now where are you going? To the post office, sir. Oh, you're not? You're going to the barber shop and get your hair cut? Yes, sir. On the double? Yes, sir. Post! That first day seemed to set the pattern. Every time I bumped into him, he found something wrong. Like the day we had our first class in boxing. All right, Sanders. You all right? All right, come on, get up there. Weren't you told left jab only, Mr. Denmore? I... I guess I forgot. Someday you're going to forget and get hurt. Leading with that phony high school right cross of yours. Don't you believe in my right cross, sir? No, I don't. Let me see it. I still don't believe it. How 
about the speech, Raymond? Well, well, there was no regulation I knew about, a, about a man mentioning his father. Anyway, all I said was that he'd done all right where we'd come from. I guess Gilman must have heard about it. And made up the speech for you? Yes, sir. Sir, that is not true. Your turn will come, Mr. Gilman. Gentlemen, you must realize by now that this so-called honor committee was merely a secret group designed to perpetuate the autocratic army system. Now we propose to show you how false and unfair that system can be by examining the character of the man it's championing. A man who came to this academy while this country was still fighting in Japan. Mr. Chairman, this attack on the academy and on the character of Cadet Gilman is completely unexpected. We request an adjournment until tomorrow. Granted. We will convene here tomorrow at nine. Just a moment, sir. We are making very serious charges against Cadet Gilman. What guarantee have we that he'll be here tomorrow? I'll be here, sir. Shouldn't Cadet Gilman be placed under guard? He has given his word. I'm sorry. I should like something a little more positive than that. Very well. Cadet Gilman, you are hereby confined to barracks after evening meal formation, and you will discuss this matter with no one. Yes, sir. The meeting is now adjourned. Been waiting long, Anne? I was about to give you up. I... I've got something to tell you that you're not going to like. I've got to break our date tonight. Why? I... I just can't explain it. But, Rocky, there must be a reason. I... I just can't be with you tonight. After three months? Why, Rocky? Uh, I can't tell you about it. Good night, Anne. If you suffer from pains of headaches, neuritis, or neuralgia, you should discover what many thousands have known for years, that Anison brings incredibly fast, effective relief. Anison is like a doctor's prescription. That is, Anison contains not just one, but a combination of medically proven active ingredients in easy-to-take tablet form. Probably at some time, you have received an envelope containing Anison tablets from your physician or dentist. Thousands of people have been introduced to Anison this way. Try Anison yourself the next time you suffer from the pains of a headache, neuritis, or neuralgia. You'll be delighted at how quickly relief can come. Anison is spelled A-N-A-C-I-N. Your druggist has Anison in handy boxes of 12 and 30 tablets and economical family-sized bottles of 50 and 100 for your medicine cabinet. Ask for Anison today. Now the second act of the Screen Director's Playhouse presentation of Beyond Glory... Starring Alan Ladd with Peter Hansen. Thus, gentlemen, 24 first classmen are elected each year by the entire corps to serve on the honor committee. The hearings are not open to the public, but they are not secret. For instance, ex cadet Denmore was invited to testify, but he refused. Is this true, Raymond? Well... You see, I didn't understand what they wanted. I, I thought it was some sort of hazing. Upperclassmen never invite plebes to join them unless it is. I think you will agree, gentlemen, that a body of men elected by the vote of the Corps offering fair hearings on all cases is the essence of democracy and in full accord with the American tradition. The point that Mr. Proctor has raised is that young Denmore received especially unfair treatment. We are prepared to answer that point. We would like to introduce Cadet Lachlan, the first classman, as a witness to Cadet Gilman's experiences when he was a plea. Take the stand, Mr. Lachlan. Yes, sir. Mr. Lachlan, you saw a good deal of what Cadet Gilman went through as a plea, didn't you? Yes, sir. His first year as a plea, my second, I had a little trouble with mathematics. We sat at the same table in the mess hall. Now, a plebe can't speak unless spoken to, and it's the duty of the upperclassmen who sit at the table to ensure that plebes observe good table manners. You see, I'd known Cadet Gilman before, and at first I was afraid he might object to some of the customs. But... Well, I needn't have worried. Sir, the cold beverage to this meal are water and lemonade. Is there anyone who doesn't care for lemonade? Send me water first, Mr. Tumjohn. Water for Mr. Milton, sir. 
Get your chin in while you're doing it. You plebes all sit up. You've been dead beating at this table long enough now. Pull out like fourth classmen should. Sit up, misters. Look and act like plebes, all of you. Move your shoulders back. Sit tall. Now, Mr. Gilman, let's have the days. Sir, today is Tuesday, September 22nd. There's a hop Saturday night for the first and second class at Column Hall. Third class in South Gymnasium. There's a, a, a football game this weekend with Columbia University at Mitchie Stadium. There are uh, 91 days left until Christmas leave. That will do, mister. Think you'll ever make a soldier? No opinion, sir. Form an opinion, mister. Sir, in the fullness of time and under the benevolence of providence, miracles may occur. Rocky's not only more experienced than any upperclassman at the point, but he had something else to cope with, something pretty rough. Being my second year as a plebe, I enjoyed upper-class privileges, and one day... Mister, don't you know you should come to attention, clear the way, and brace when upperclassmen pass? Yes, sir. Then why are you standing improperly? No excuse, sir. Let's see the proper posture. Head high, shoulders flat. Flat, both shoulders, mister. That's better. Now, hold it, Milton. You can relax, mister. Say, what goes on, Lachlan? Are you a special pet of yours, your son or something? I said you can relax, mister. Now, just a minute. If there's been a special order making a privileged character out of Mr. Dumbflicket here, nobody's passed me the word. Ah, look, in 42, we were together in... Well? I make myself responsible for his continued proper conduct, for my own reasons. Well, it better not be he has a good-looking sister. I told you you could relax, Rocky. Now relax. What is it, that shoulder again? I'm doing all right. You crazy? You want to wreck yourself for good? Can't go around bracing that shoulder. It's been torn apart like yours has. No statement, sir. Oh, knock it off, Lieutenant. You can't do it all, you know. Not when you've got half the lead in North Africa making that shoulder hump. Now, don't go around bracing it. It's going to hurt. Well, the way I see it, sir, it's like disobeying an order. Well, you've got to learn when not to obey. I've learned that all right. Well, anyway, you pull that shoulder apart and you'll be dismissed for disability. Sir, may I, may I ask a question? Ah, oh, don't be stupid. Who did you whine to last year? Gilman took as much or more than 90% of the men who've gone through the academy. He didn't whimper. But then, of course, he didn't have a rich father to write home Mr. to. Mr. Chairman, I object to that. This is not a court of law, Mr. Proctor. In the last few years, we've had a number of veterans in the plebe class, including one major, seven captains, and over 100 lieutenants. But we've made no concessions, not even to those who were decorated for conspicuous bravery, as was Cadet Captain Gilman. Oh, we're very interested in Mr. Gilman's war record. Perhaps he'd like to tell us something about it. If you want me to, sir. We'd like to hear about every detail. But I warn you, Mr. Gilman, we know a good deal about your history, so I advise you not to distort anything. I don't intend to, sir. Well, suppose we start at the beginning. You were drafted, weren't you? Yes, sir. I was drafted. But I never thought it was anything to be ashamed of. You see, it happened to quite a lot of us. I'll admit I wasn't very happy about it. You see, I... I had a job, and... There was a future in it. And I... Well, I had a girl. And Christmas was coming on. Christmas of 1941. And I had... Well, I had a pretty good idea I wasn't going to like the Army. I started out by not liking officers. Some of them, anyway. I remember one shaved tail who wanted to court-martial me because... Well, because I was trying to help another kid with his gear. The first lieutenant came up just in time. Lieutenant, come with me. There's something I want to talk to you about. That shave tail's kind of crusty. Yeah, proud of his bar. Yeah. He can keep it. My name's Lachlan. What's yours? Rocky Gilman. Thanks, Rocky, for your help. It's okay. Well, the next couple of weeks didn't change my opinion about the Army. Well, Lieutenant Daniel seemed to be a pretty good Joe, even if he was a West Pointer. Then something happened that gave me a different slant. Lieutenant Daniels had just been reading us excerpts from the Articles of War. Any person subject to military law who, on any pretense whatsoever, willfully disobeys any lawful command of his superior officer shall suffer death or such other punishment as the court-martial may direct. Any questions, men? Oh, Lieutenant, does that mean that we have to obey every order of an officer? That's the way it reads, as long as it's a lawful order. Well, even when you know that officer is incompetent or inexperienced? Gilman, if you don't like the quality of the Army's officers, that's your responsibility. Huh? Why is it my responsibility? You can apply for officers' candidate school and improve it. Oh, no thanks, Lieutenant. This is your Army. It's our uh, Army. Lieutenant, uh, Lieutenant, this just came in. Mm. 
Men. We're at war. The Japanese have bombed Pearl Harbor. You'll remain in your quarters until further orders. Dismissed. Lieutenant. Yes, Gilman? How does one go about applying for officers' candidate school? Well, the next three months were a scramble for a guy who'd breeze through high school. Well, because things in books came easy for me. But who couldn't get it into his head that an order wasn't a term used when they wanted to kick you around. I didn't think I was going to make it. But finally I did. And when I got my orders... Sir, Lieutenant Gummy reporting as... Lieutenant! I, I mean, Captain Daniels. Gilman, it's good to see you. Oh, you don't mean to tell me you requested me. I figured since I was responsible in sending you, the least I could do was ask for you. You don't mind, Lieutenant? I couldn't ask for a better break. Thanks a lot. Forget it. You may change your mind when you learn where we're going. Where's that? You get seasick? Mm, I don't know, sir. You will. Oh, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Eddie. Eddie Lachlan. Rocky! Oh, excuse me, sir. Look at the rank on him, Captain. You better go look your outfit over, Rocky. We're in the best regiment. We are, Eddie? We are, Rocky. I was seasick, all right. Halfway to England, on the next leg. Go on, Mr. Gilman. We went into action against Rommel's army at four o'clock one morning on a, on a ridge just outside of Tunis. Well, please continue, Mr. Gilman. Uh, a little after four, but what was left of us were on our way to, to a field hospital. Would you like to tell us a little more about that engagement? No. No, I wouldn't. As I thought you wouldn't. How long were you in the hospital? On and off for about two years. They let me go in March of 1945. They said spring was just around the corner, and I... I guess peace was, too. Tell me, Mr. Gilman, did you pay a call along about that time on Mrs. Harry Daniels, the wife of your commanding officer? Yes, sir, I did. When was that? Just before I got my appointment to West Point. And would you care to reveal to us what you had to tell Mrs. Harry Daniels? That was and still is a personal matter, sir. Did this personal matter have anything to do with your entering West Point? In a way, yes. Is that all you've got to tell us? Yes, sir. You may step down. <laughs> Gentlemen, you have heard Cadet Captain Gilman's testimony. I shall now prove that this paragon of West Point is lacking in all essentials of responsibility. That he's unfit to take his place among normal, decent men. I would like to introduce Mr. John Craig. Will you please, Mr. Craig? Of course. Mr. Craig was medical corps attendant at Walter Reed Hospital. Mr. Craig, did your duties involve attending on the then Lieutenant Rockwell Gilman? Uh, yes, sir. He was in a four bed ward. He was plenty of trouble, too. He had nightmares. I say he deserved them. Ordinarily, I could shake him out of them, but one night, I. Well, I couldn't make any headway. It's my fault. My fault. Three minutes. Three. Minutes. What's the matter? He's at it again. Uh, oh, easy there, Lieutenant. Easy. Uh, now, take uh, it easy. Hello, Doctor. Now, Lieutenant, you're, you're going to feel a lot better if you can just talk. I don't want to talk. Now, hold still. This is going to help, and, well, I'll tell you just how it's going to feel. You're going to get a little drowsy, but you'll remain conscious. Now, uh, just relax. Unclench your fist, Lieutenant. Now, start counting backwards from 100. You hear? 100, 99, 98. Start counting. 100, 99, 98. That's right. 97, 96, 95. Come on, keep it up. 95, 94. 95, 94. Yeah, that's fine. Now we can begin our talk. Lieutenant, you're going to remember everything just as you saw it. Every detail. No. Uh -uh. Now, don't fight it. You're going to remember everything just as you saw it. It was something that happened in combat, wasn't it? You were being fired at. Uh, 
Yes, that's it. We were under fire. We were on a ridge. Mm -hmm. And you were being shot at? Shot at from... from an olive grove. Tank kept spitting fire at us every few minutes. Yes, go on. We... we were holding the ridge. Were you in command? No, no, no. Well, who was? He, he was. Who was he? Say his name. You, you know it. Uh, Harry. His full name. Cap... Captain Harry Daniels. You didn't like him, did you? Yes. It... Yes, I did. Then he was your friend? He's my friend. All right, fine. Now let's talk about the tank. You feel like talking now, don't you? I suppose so. What did you do about the tank? Harry. Yes? Harry took some of the men. He went down the right. I, I took the rest and went down the left. He, he ordered me. He, he ordered you to do what? 4.15. Four 4.15. What happened at 4.15? He made a racket to attract attention. And you were to attack, to, to rush the tank? Yes, but I, but I didn't. I, Why I didn't, didn't you? Uh, I don't know. Yes, you do. No, I don't. I, I don't know. Think. You knew if you didn't, Captain Daniels would be knocked out. Now, why didn't you attack, Lieutenant? There must have been a good reason. There wasn't any reason. But you did go after it. No, no. You got the no. tank, remember? You knocked it out personally with a bazooka. I disobeyed. When I came out, Harry was gone. They don't give the DSC for disobeying orders, Lieutenant. Now, there must be something, some reason you didn't come out. Yes, there was. I turned yellow. That's the reason I... I turned yellow. I killed him, Doctor. I murdered my best friend. Now, here's a word from RCA Victor. Five in one. Five superb instruments in one great combination. That's what you get when you invest in RCA Victor's new television radio phonograph combination, the Rutland. Yes, here in one beautiful cabinet, you'll find big 17-inch RCA Victor million-proof television. Television that brings you clear, bright pictures. Steady pictures that are locked in place by RCA Victor's exclusive eyewitness picture synchronizer. You'll enjoy the latest and greatest RCA Victor AM and FM radio. Plus two superb automatic record changers for recorded music at all three speeds. Yes, five superb instruments. Yet, because you pay for only one sound system, only one cabinet, their cost is far less than what you'd pay for comparable console instruments separately. So when you invest in a television set, insist on the best. Insist on RCA Victor Television. See and hear the Rutland and the many other fine RCA Victor television sets available now at your RCA Victor dealers. You are listening to Screen Directors Playhouse. One of the weekly features on NBC's All-Star Festival, brought to you by the makers of Anison for fast relief from the pain of headache, neuritis, and neuralgia, and by RCA Victor, world leader in radio, first in recorded music, first in television. The Screen Director's Playhouse presentation of Beyond Glory, starring Alan Ladd with Peter Hansen, will continue in just a moment after a brief pause for station identification. <laughs> This is the Screen Director's Playhouse. We continue with the third act of Beyond Glory, starring Alan Ladd in his original role of Rocky Gilman, with Peter Hansen as Lachlan and Betty Moran as Anne. And there, gentlemen, you have the Academy's model cadets. The man whose word this institution accepts above that of my client's son. A man whose criminal disobedience resulted in murder. 
Do you wish to amplify Mr. Craig's testimony, Mr. Gilman? No, sir. Mr. Julian? Just a minute, Mr. Proctor. Mr. Gilman, do you realize these charges, if substantiated, are very serious? Yes, sir. And you will make no statement? No, sir. Gentlemen, I think this young man should be given a few hours to reconsider. There may be mitigating factors. We will reconvene at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. Gentlemen, the board is now in session. But I see that Cadet Gilman is not here. We have someone looking for him now, Mr. Julian. I wouldn't bother, General. I understand that Mr. Gilman has left the Academy, I believe, permanently. Why, that's impossible. It would have been reported. You see, General, I haven't the naive faith that you have in your so-called honor committee. I took the rather practical precaution of having Mr. Gilman followed. I assure you he was in New York last evening at a certain young lady's apartment. And I believe, gentlemen, that closes our case. I move that you recommend the reinstatement of Mr. Denmore's son and the immediate overhaul of the Academy's administration. Uh, just a minute, Mr. Proctor. Sorry to be late, sir, but... I'll hear your explanation later, Mr. Gilman. Yes, Take sir. Your place. Mr. Gilman, have you decided to make a statement? Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, I object. This man has proved his unreliability by leaving the Academy without permission. Whatever he says is bound to be suspected. Nevertheless, we will hear him, Mr. Proctor. What have you to say about Mr. Craig's story? It's true, sir. Exactly as he said. You are admitting your disobedience caused the death of Captain Daniels? Yes, sir. That's not true. And you mustn't. Just a moment, just a moment, please. What is your name, young lady? This is Harry Daniels. Mr. Gilman isn't responsible for anybody's death. Are you sure of that, Mrs. Daniels? I know Mr. Gilman too well to believe anything like that. I've known him for three years. Mrs. Daniels, may I ask you... Did you know him before your husband was... That will do, Mr. Proctor. If you'll just let me tell you about him. How we first met. How and why he came to the point. How he's done everything in his power to make a perfect officer out of himself. I think you'll see he can't be guilty of... I suggest that the young lady confine her testimony to what happened last night in New York. As I have said before, this is not a court of law, Mr. Proctor. Please be seated, Mrs. Daniels. Mr. Reggett... I first met Mr. Gilman on V.E. night. The streets were crowded with people celebrating. But I didn't go out of my apartment. I understood how they felt and couldn't blame them for wanting to celebrate. They were happy and relieved that half a war had been won. To me, the war had ended a long time ago. On a hearing. Yes? I'm... I'm looking for Mrs. Daniels. Which Mrs. Daniels? The Mrs. Daniels whose... The son was Captain Daniels. Does she live here? Yes, she does. And so do I. I'm his wife. You look exactly like your pictures. Where did you see my picture? In Africa. You were in Africa? Please come in. And won't you sit down? No, thanks. What's your name? You never heard of me. It's Rocky Gilman. Never heard of you? Why, Harry's letters were filled with stories about you. He said you were the most valuable officer he had. When will his mother be home? Not for a while yet. Then you'll have to do. To do what? Help me celebrate V-Day. Help me wind up some unfinished business. I don't understand. Mrs. Daniels, you... You think your husband was killed by the Germans, don't you? Well, he wasn't. I killed him. Disobeyed a direct order, and when I got around to being where I should have been, it was too late. He was... He was dead. Well, why don't you say something? I can take it. That's... That's what I came up for. To hear someone say the things I've been saying to myself, bring it out in the open. This is Daniels. Maybe you didn't understand. I just said I killed your husband. They've got words for people like me. Maybe you need time in a dictionary. Well, you'll find him if you can't. Maybe his mother can. When she does, I'll be in Pop Dilly's place, Brooklyn.
could I speak to you, please? Mr. Gelman? Must have found your Dixon. May I say something? Sure, go ahead. Even if you did disobey, you didn't mean to. It was a mistake, wasn't it? You don't make mistakes like that, Nan. People make mistakes everywhere. That's a part of being human. You mustn't blame yourself too much. I don't get it. Didn't you love Harry? I loved him very much. Why are you concerning yourself about me? You're just like all these people around here, all dancing on coffins. Don't you know a million men died for this day? They just believed it's over. What's the matter with everybody? And what's the matter with you? I don't get your kind wording me. I think maybe I could make you understand. But not here. Where? Will you come with me? It's not far. All right. tonight, Mr. Gilman. Yeah, I see what you mean. They're here every day. They're filling churches like this all over the world. There are a lot of people who know how much a victory costs. Yeah. Shall we go? Mm Mm-hmm. Would you like some coffee? No, I... I think I'll be running tonight. Good night. Oh, Thanks for the new slant. I'll do some thinking about it. I hope you will. Good night. Good night. I didn't sleep that night. I couldn't. Memories of Harry tumbled through my head like leaves in a windstorm. And in the lulls, I thought of Rocky. Tortured by a guilt complex that was on the verge of unsettling his mind. It was almost dawn when I realized what I had to do. Realized that my obligation was not only toward the dead, but toward the living, too. Two days later, I found Rocky again. He was living like a hermit in a little hotel room. He wouldn't go out that first day, and in the first week, I took enough rebuffs to alienate almost anybody. But by that time, I wasn't almost anybody. I was someone with a purpose in life, so I stayed with it. And it began to work. We had lunches and walks on the battery. And finally, he came to the apartment for dinner. At last, he got up enough nerve to meet Harry's mother. And he liked her. And he began to talk about finding a job. Then one day, Mother and I received invitations to attend a ceremony. I didn't tell him what kind of ceremony. But I thought it might be sick to kill this rock. According to the custom established nearly a hundred years ago, this plaque has been presented to the Academy by Captain Harry Daniels' classmates. This plaque is dedicated to the memory of an Academy graduate who gave his life to his country. But, like the other plaques that adorn these walls, it is far more than a memorial to an individual. It is a memorial to a trying yet glorious page of American history. I see, as I look around, other pages commemorated. Sam Juan Hill, Bellow Woods, Chateau Thierry, Pearl Harbor... What's the matter, Rocky? Corregidor. Why did you walk away? Why don't we start back? The general wants us to have lunch first. Some other time. Why did you include me in this? You were one of his friends. I'm sorry if being here has upset you. No, I guess it's just being around the army again. I've had enough of it. Uniforms saluting this place. This West Point filled with toy soldiers. Rich kids sneaking in on a political pull. Sponging off the taxpayers. Mr. Rocky! Eddie! Oh, my gosh, Eddie. What a surprise. You're looking great. Oh, and this is Sergeant Lachlan. Uh, used to be, Sergeant, that is. How do you do? But he was in our outfit, too. That's right. Oh, Eddie. Ann was, uh, was Harry Daniels' wife. Oh. I, I was in the captain's company, and, well, we all thought he was tops. Thank you. 
Hey, what's a guy like you doing in this place? I thought you were tired of the Army. I'm getting an education. But you can get that a hundred other places a much better. Not an education like this, Rocky. Look, I saw, and, and so did you, what happens to countries with second-best armies. So when I found out they were taking a group of enlisted men each year, I boned up on the exams. Uh-oh, oh, there goes that trumpet again. Do you have a formation before lunch? Yes. You better make it on the double. I'm sorry, I have to go. Let me know where I can get in touch with you, Rocky. Sure, Eddie. Goodbye, Miss Daniel. Goodbye. Rich kids with political qualities. Come on. Mother, I'm going out for a while. But I thought Rocky was coming over. He is. Would you tell him that I have a date? Who will? You don't have to tell him who will. It's just that I... I don't want to see him. Had a quarrel? No. And I've known all the time somebody was bound to come along. I'm going to miss you. But I'm very happy for you. I can't. Of course you can. No. I haven't the right. Oh, darling, is that what you've been thinking? Let me show you something. I suppose I should have read this to you sooner, but... Well, like Harry, I wanted to wait for the proper time. This was his last letter. I'll read the part about you. Listen. And now, Mother, I want to say something very serious. Things happen fast here, and you never know. If I'm unlucky, I want you to give Anne a message for me. Not right away, but when the time comes... I don't want her to mourn me too long. She's too young to spend the rest of her life living with a memory. I want her to have a normal life. To have a husband and a home and... Well, darling, that's about all. But you know that Harry meant every word of it. That's probably Rocky now. Hello, Anne. Hello, Rocky. Hello, Mrs. Daniels. Hey, Come on over and sit down, both of you. I can't stay long. Why not? Oh, I've got things to do. I've got news for you. You found a job. Well, maybe you'll call it a job. It only pays a couple of bucks a day. And keep... Where did you find a job like that? West Point. West Point? Rocky, you're not serious. Well, what's the matter with West Point? Oh, well, nothing except... I didn't think you liked the Army. Well, that trip you took me on, it started me doing a lot of thinking. Oh, Rocky, we're both so... Proud of you. There isn't a finer oh, thing. Oh, now, wait a minute. Don't start blowing the bugles yet. You see, I've figured it out on a strictly cash basis. It's a free ride. The taxpayers are footing all the bills. And they say it's one of the finest engineering courses in the world. Well, you know, a graduate can get a job any place he wants to. So, in four years, I'm in business. Four years. Wonderful, Rocky. Just wonderful. We've I knew all that talk about a free education was a blind to cover the truth. I knew he was trying to pay the debt he thought he owed by taking Harry's place. But what I thought about most was that army regulation which said that if a cadet married before graduation... He would have to resign from the academy. The only thing I had to cling to was a date seven months old. Enjoying yourself? It's fun. But I wish it was more often. Only three and a half years to graduation. Then what? Then what? Uh-huh. Why? Then I get my commission. Here's hoping they'll be married soon and Army Blue? 
I love it. You'll be back for Easter, won't you? Do you want me to? You know I want you to. Nights are the pattern of our lives for the next three years. Minutes of happiness, separated by months of waiting. But I realized that Rocky was finding himself at the point. He pushed the dark thing in his mind out of sight. But as he became more normal, I began to disintegrate. I still had nothing to cling to, no understanding, only hope. And then, out of the blue, and apparently for no reason... Just two days ago, he broke a date I'd been living for since July. Rocky, you have to tell me. I I can't see it tonight, and I can't discuss it. That was the last straw. I could think of only one thing to do. So I sent him a letter telling him that I decided to break it off and go away. I planned to leave this morning, but last night... Rocky! Well... Aren't you going to let me in? What are you doing in New York? And in civilian clothes? I picked them up at Pop's place. How did you happen to get leave? It doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is that we go away. Rocky, answer me. Do they know you've come to New York? What difference does it make if they know? You're deserting? I'm saving them all the trouble of firing a misfit, that's all. Oh, Rocky, I don't understand, but you have to tell me. You must be in trouble. Please tell me what it is. There's nothing to tell except what I just realized today. I'm just not for the point. I'll never be a soldier, and... uh, So I beat them to the punch and resigned. You resigned? Yes, there's a phrase that says, for the good of the service. For three years, you... For three years, I've been sending to you and to myself and to the point that, well, that I could make up for a mistake. But this can't be done. Oh, it's only cowards and weaklings who can't rise above a mistake, who aren't the better for having made one. Can't you see, Rocky? I can see that you're making a good try. But it's not good enough. Where are we going? We're not going anywhere. You're going back to the point. Didn't you just write me and tell me that you couldn't stand being apart? Yes, I did. Well, don't you see? We're not going to be apart any longer. Isn't that what you wanted? Yes, I... I thought it was. But now that it's here, all I can think of is how hard you've worked for three years. The things you've made yourself go through... The times you must have been twice as disappointed and discouraged as I was. Now, look. Whose side are you on? Ours or theirs? Theirs, Rocky. I won. Finally. I think perhaps because he wanted me to win. So early this morning, I drove him back to the point in time for him to tear up his letter of resignation. This is very touching, but aren't we getting away from the original point? This man's flagrant disobedience caused the death of his commanding officer. What does the army do in such cases? I think it calls for a general court-martial, doesn't it? Uh, Mr. Julian, the academy has one more witness. Dr. Joseph White, formerly a psychiatrist at the Walter Reed Hospital in Washington. With him is Cadet Lachlan, who has already been on the stand. Dr. White. Gentlemen, our department had a great deal of experience with combat neuroses. Oh, perhaps 5,000 cases. Usually, I can spot the source of trouble, real or imagined, in a very short time. We're interested in Cadet Gilman, Doctor, not in lectures on psychiatry. That's the reason I've asked Mr. Lachlan to be on the stand with me. Mr. Lachlan, will you please tell the board exactly what you told me uh, concerning the incident in Tunisia? Uh, From the start, if you will, please. Well, what was left of our company was on a ridge. It was about 300 yards from an olive grove. We all knew what was in that grove, something that was due to come out at daybreak and stalk us. Stalk us and pounce. That's the way that brand of tank worked. That's why we called it the Tiger. (laughs) 
Rocky. Yes, Captain? There are two ravines cutting through this ridge. I'll take four men and go through the one on the right. You take five men on the bazooka and go around to the left. At exactly 4.15, I'll attract his attention by making a lot of racket. As soon as he traverses to me, you move up with the bazooka. If you can get close enough with it, we'll be in business. Got you. You've got to move fast. We can't take more than one or two shots. You must be there at exactly 4.15 or it's curtains for us. Now let's check our watches. Right. Let's get going. Good luck, Rocky. You too, Harry. I was one of five with Rocky. It was the first time any of us had come face to face with a tank. That ravine suddenly seemed about as private as Fifth Avenue on an Easter Sunday. It seemed like the tiger felt that way, too. I heard a moan from Whitey behind me, and I turned back, shelf just below the collarbone. Rocky moved ahead while I practiced a little first aid, and just about the time I got through, Harry Daniels' racket started on the other side of the hill. But before the tank traversed over Daniels' way, it, it let off one final terrific blast right in our face. When I caught up with Rocky, I, I thought for a second he'd got it bad, but it was just a concussion from a near miss. He apparently didn't know he'd been out cold. He, he was still dazed, Rocky. What's wrong, Rocky? Uh, well, what time you got? Oh, 4.18. Three minutes. Huh? Give me that bazooka. He grabbed it, crawled straight through the muck and rock and men and machines and, until he was almost in the tank itself. And then he let fly. You got him, Rocky. Come on, let's get to Captain Daniels. Okay. Three minutes, just three lousy minutes. I wondered what he meant. I just figured he must have been hit pretty hard. I never knew until Dr. White told me today that Rocky thought he'd spent those three minutes getting up his nerve to go after that tank. You you mean I was out for three minutes in that gully? That's right. Gentlemen, this is the link I failed to find. During those critical three minutes, Gilman was not clinging to the ground, numbed with terror as his combat-shattered nerves later convinced him. He was unconscious and therefore not responsible. Eddie, why didn't you tell me this before? You never would let me talk about it, Rocky. Remember? Mr. Chairman, I would like to... Doctor, you shut up. What? I'm Mr. Dunmore. I said shut up. You, Raymond, you come with me. Now, Raymond, I want you to face Mr. Gilman and tell him he's a liar. Now, so that's it. All right. You won't wait for me in the car. I... I guess I was all wrong about everything here, General, and I... I want to apologize. For all of us. Mr. Gilman, I'm very sorry. Sir. Thank you, sir. Graduating this class, I say to you who have chosen to devote yourselves in the military service of the nation, you help man the fortress for which freedom still finds need. This, your immediate mission, is one upon which the very existence of our nation may depend. The fortress must be strong. Is garrison the embodiment of military efficiency? So long as West Point's graduates continue one in spirit with the men they lead, That long shall this school live in the proud boast that it serves America faithfully and well. Now that you've graduated, what do you think you're doing, Mr. Dumjohn? Nothing, ma'am. Get a brace on those shoulders, mister. Yes, ma'am. Do you think you'll ever be a soldier, mister? No opinion, ma'am. Don't you know how to behave in the presence of your superior officer? Yes, ma'am. Well, don't just stand. Mission accomplished. Beautifully done, Lieutenant.
Thank you, Alan Ladd and Peter Hansen, for your fine performances. Our star will return in just a moment with screen director John Farrell. Next week, the Screen Director's Playhouse will bring you one of the greatest Western stories of all time, The Gunfighter. And our star will be Gregory Peck with Screen Director Henry King. Now, here is tonight's star, Alan Ladd. Thank you, Jimmy. Ladies and gentlemen, in the making of a picture, there are many important elements. None ever more important than the director. May I introduce the man under whose direction I have made four pictures up to now? Mr. John Farrell. Thank you, Alan. Well? What do you mean, well? Well, how'd you like the show? You know, Alan, I think it's the very first time that I ever really heard the whole story of Beyond Glory. I'm not surprised. When we got to West Point, do you remember what General Taylor said to us? I certainly do. He said very firmly, Gentlemen, I would like to see the script. And you said... Just as firmly, General, so would I. It was true, too. We only had a half a page when we got there, but with the help of General Eisenhower, the Academy staff, and the Corps of Cadets, it worked out, and I think it helped. You know, John, I was mighty happy to do the picture. And it might interest you, ladies and gentlemen, to know that at the time we made Beyond Glory, every university in the country was overcrowded. But West Point had only a few applicants for admission. In view of the situation, the Army suggests to one of our executives that a picture be made of this great, great institution as it is today. That's true. And the general himself appeared in it, which is a pretty good plus for any picture. And so are you, John. And I'm looking forward to our next one. Thanks a lot, Alan. And thanks for tonight. And my thanks, too, to Peter Hansen. Peter, as you know, Alan, is a member of Paramount's famed golden circle of future stars. And tonight he played the part of Lachlan. Thanks for being here, John. Good night. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Beyond Glory was presented through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures, whose forthcoming release is Ace in the Hole, starring Kirk Douglas and Jan Sterling, which will have its world premiere in Albuquerque, New Mexico, on June 14th. Alan Ladd is currently being seen in a Paramount picture, Appointment with Danger. Peter Hansen can be seen in a Pine Thomas production for Paramount, The Last Outpost. John Farrow's forthcoming Paramount picture is Submarine Command, starring William Holden, William Bendix, and Nancy Olsen. Included in tonight's cast were Ralph Moody, Bill Conrad, Byron Kane, Lou Merrill, Betty Moran, Lee Millar, Jack Moyles, Hope Sansbury, and Val Brown. Beyond Glory was adapted for radio by Nat Wolf. Production is under the supervision of Howard Wiley and is directed by Bill Carn. This is Jimmy Wallington speaking and inviting you to listen again next Thursday when the Screen Director's Playhouse will bring you for the first time on the air The Gunfighter, starring Gregory Peck with Screen Director Henry King. <laughs> Listen again next week to the Screen Director's Playhouse, one of the weekly features on NBC's all-star festival of comedy, music, mystery, and drama. Listen tomorrow evening for Van Heflin as The Man Called X, the Friday night feature of the all-star festival. Tomorrow, The Man Called X and The Amazing Mr. Malone on NBC. NBC.